Thank you all for your opening remarks. Uh, we have a lot to talk about. Uh, I'll start out by asking some uh, questions to the panel, and then uh, after a little while, we'll open up uh, for questions from the floor. So if any of you want to prepare for that, uh, you have some minutes, OK? Um, <coughs> let's start by, by um, Paul. Uh, you said you, you quoted a, a gifted writer uh, in, in, in the last chapter of his book there. But uh, right now, at the, at the present time, how do you judge our, our governments or the Western governments' ability to address uh, the things you said in that uh, last chapter? What are the status quo there for you? Um, I know most about um, the UK government, um, and what I know of other governments is really uh, sort of information I pick up at meetings such as this. Um, so I'd, I'd say that it, well, in the UK, of course, you know, the intelligent men and women all, all through government, even at the moment, I think, almost, um, at least for another month or so, um, strugg struggling, <laughs> struggling. Are you looking at me? No, because of, your, because of your comment about parliamentarians. Uh, and I've just lost my gadget. <laughs> just checking. Yeah. Um, so I think they're very familiar with... with you know, with the sorts of arguments I'm, I'm making, okay, I love, I love that the future is the future is complicated. Oh. But it, what it all comes down, and the okay. bloody technology just yeah. gets in the way. Of it. <laughs> but, but what it comes down to, what it comes down to is 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 the lack of money. And my my argument, as I've been rehearsing, really, is that this isn't good enough. You know, we all understand that there isn't in the UK a, a great deal of money at the moment. We've had ten years of austerity, all that kind of stuff. We all get it. But at that at that very moment, to say that somehow that we can we can take the whole defence and security problem and sort of put it in the awkward tray for a few years, because the, the Russians aren't coming yet, or, or this or that isn't quite happening, you know, this isn't, doesn't, isn't really the Cold War anymore, and, and, and so on. It's as if we can parcel it up and put it to one side and have a bit of a strategic holiday. Uh, that's how I describe the UK mood at the moment. There's, of course there's awareness of the problem and the longer term challenges and so on, but we're thinking we can have a strategic holiday. And we've done this twice before in the UK. We did it in the, uh, after 1919 until about 1932. We had what we called a 10-year no-war rule. That's what they call it, a 10-year no-war rule. And every year, because there hadn't been a war, you added another year. So it turned into being a rolling rule. And it carried on and on until in the early 30s, uh, it was realized that things were getting a little bit um, tense in Germany, and uh, with Germany rather. And so we began rearming, arguably too late, or later than we needed it. Then we tried the same thing again after 1945, believe it or not. But then there was a, a very clear sense that we made a mistake in the 20s with the 10-year rule. So in the UK, what we did in 1945 was to have a 5 plus 5 no-war rule. Um, 5 plus 5, of course, adding up to 10. Uh, and that only lasted a couple of years until 1947. So this is what I'm getting at. There is a, a, ten, a counterintuitive tendency uh, to go for a strategic holiday, especially when times are hard. And that's what I'm trying to argue against. And I don't quite know whether it applies um, in, in, here in Norway, but it probably does a bit. Yeah. Uh, Christopher, uh, the, the robots and, and uh, what they can do, as you talked about uh, in, in your opening remarks, but, but who comes up with the ideas? Who sort of design? Who makes the design? And, and uh, I was thinking that there might be a parallel here to the debate about biotechnology and genetics and what you can do to embryos and, you know, and all these uh, limitations on what should medical research do and not do where you get to, into ethical dilemmas. But how do you see that debate in, in, the, in the technology that you talked about? Who can set the boundaries? Can we maybe have like a new sort of anti-landmine treaty for autonomous weapons or something like that? Or don't you see that coming? Well, I don't see it working. No. It'll probably come. But uh, no, I just want to address one particular aspect of this, and it's, it's called the responsibility gap uh, by, by roboticists. Uh, if robots, robotics is to work, we will find intelligence emerging in the same way that it emerges in a human child. So we don't actually engineer the child. The child learns by adapting to its external environment. Sure, we can teach certain lessons once the child masters language, and we can communicate inherited uh, knowledge. But basically, intelligence in a child is an emergent property, as we say. And that will certainly be the same with robotics. And it's, it's the case now with elevators, for example, which can reprogram themselves independently according to the amount of human traffic 
that is uh, coming in and out in the course of the day. And um, there was an article on robotics actually in The Economist, I mentioned The Economist before, in 2012, saying that that is, it's not a top down, it's a bottom up. That's the future of robotics. We have to take an imaginative leap because it is the next stage of our own development and our own evolution. Uh, I'm afraid that is the reality. Okay. Uh as we know, the, the world or the international uh, community has developed a whole set of rules and laws and, and practices and, and even like I mean, internal moral obligations for uh, warfare and, and even conflicts. And you have the R2P concept and you have Security Council, big institutions. Uh, and, uh, and they're both legal and moral, I would say. But how do they all these institutions, all the morals, all the practices, how do they connect or how do they cope with the, with the new battlefields and the, and the new weapon systems and even robotics? I can open that up for the whole panel if someone wanna, wanna elaborate on that. Can I just make one, one comment on that? And I always tell my students when I lecture on Clausewitz, that Clausewitz tells you quite clearly, the ethics of war emerges from uh, the battlefield itself. So it's not in the hands of lawyers. What lawyers do is they codify existing conventions and practices that are sometimes thousands of years old. And the point he makes is prisoners of war. Why do we take prisoners of war? Uh, and why do we repatriate them? Why do we feed them? Why do we keep them safe? Because it's sensible to do that. Why is it sensible to do that? Because as he said, you only win a war when the enemy is willing to admit its defeat. Otherwise it continues as we see in Afghanistan indefinitely. And you only win a war, not by killing people, but by getting them to surrender. You, you actually can historically see when you have started to win by the number of people who are willing to surrender. But they won't surrender, of course, unless they're absolutely certain that they'll be coming back home at some point. So ethics inheres in the practice of war itself. And in the 19th century, we started codifying everything because we live in a contractual society with prenuptial agreements, for example. So <laughs> yes. everything is now codified. Yes, Martin. No, I, I thought. The problem now is that the, the way that, um, not war, but how conflict is played out in Europe today, it challenges the very identity as liberal democracy, right? Which is was what, what I uh, hinted at with my question, are, are we as liberal democracies able to fight dirty? Should we fight dirty in the face of hybrid warfare, whatever you call these things, right? And I think uh, that's part of the problem, uh, that the, the, the way that conflict is being played out right now I mean, not, not potentially, but it is being played out right now with the way that we, we do cyber attacks and all these kind of things. Is how do we respond to them? And I, I think uh, we have a problem because during the Cold War, we had intelligence services, we had all these things, we, we, which, we, which did play out this conflict, but hidden. But it, that doesn't happen anymore. <coughs> so I think there's a very big challenge in that, in the fact that we try to fight uh, an adversary who has all access to these means that we don't. But, but uh, uh, if you look at the classical sort of escalation of conflict, there are uh, quite a few thresholds that you have to pass uh, before military power is applied, I mean, classically at least. Yeah. Uh, if you remember the first Gulf War, I mean, there was quite a long period from where the threat was made by the US and then uh, before, the, before they started rolling into uh, Kuwait. And, uh, and while we are at that sort of escalation process, there is diplomacy running and political initiatives and weapons inspectors and, and whatnot. But, but this new technology, does that make that whole sort of, it's kind of, a, it's hope in that. It's like uh, that we can avoid conflict by, by having a sort of a long lead up to the actual conflict itself, armed conflict. But with this new technology, are we removing that possibility to finding a sort of a peaceful solution or a political solution uh, before we apply uh, some kind of military or at least aggressive power in the conflict. Is that the result of, of the new technological technological advances? I, I think if can I? Yeah, sure. I think I think it's certainly one one aspect of it. Um, uh, when I uh, talk about um, the cyber security challenge, I um, I often refer to this the expression the, the zero day um, exploit. You'll you'll have heard of it. Um, the the software bug that. Is, is there, is known about, but just not by us. <coughs> and we don't get to know about it until it's released uh, and does its damage. But I then couple that. I, have, I talk about three zeros. It's not just zero day, it's zero source. Uh, we don't know where the attack is coming from. Is it the spotty teenager in his bedroom, or is it something more sinister? 
Uh, is, it, is it done by proxy from a government via another uh, a base somewhere else? And we don't know the intention either. <clears throat> so if you take out the, the, the warning time, if you take out the source, and if you take out some understanding of the intention, um, then in classical strategic thinking, you are, uh, as they say, stuffed. Um, <laughs> what do you do with this thing? Um, how, how can you react and when and, and who knows what? Um, but I wanted to, if I could, pick up another point that, that's provoked by, uh, prompted by something that um, Christopher said, which is, and I think, Per, as well, you, you, you avert to the same thing, which is that quite a lot of this, um, the problem that we're discussing, whether it's in cyber or in some other areas, <clears throat> is actually, it, the, the problem with it is that it's below the threshold. Um, in the US, they refer to the LOAC threshold, the law of armed conflict threshold. <clears throat> and they always get a bit irritated that in, the, in Europe, we've abandoned LOAC and we, excuse me, we use the term IHL, International Humanitarian Law, instead, but of course they're both the same thing. So anyway, the US are very fixated on the problem uh, of activity that's aggressive, uh, predatory, uh, <coughs> threatening, happening below the LOAC threshold. Above it, in a way, we're fine because the UN and, and we've all agreed internationally that the laws of war, if you want to call it that, call them that, uh, apply no matter what. And I think I think we've already heard that this morning. Um, that war is war. You know, destruction is destruction. Killing is killing. So what's the problem? They apply when all those things are going on. But it's all these activities below that threshold that we really don't know what we should be doing with. Anyone want to tag on? Yes. Yeah, I think I just. <coughs> Add a very simple point to that, and I think that uh, I think our adversaries and us, we're, we're pretty much aware of that threshold where we go into conflict or war. But the way that we have organized our societies, the way that we become vulnerable, which is that we will have to suffer quite a lot of hardship before we, we reach that threshold, and that is already taking uh, a toll at uh, our governments in Europe at the moment, because which means that we have to endure. Um, phenomena that we don't define as threats, such as refugee flows and all these kind of things. But it means that our societies will have to endure quite a lot until we reach a threshold of war, which makes it rather simple, actually, because then we know what to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, Christopher? Yeah, I just make uh, two points. Um, there was a Pentagon war game uh, a few years ago, um, which was about a, an actually the, the scenario of Ghost Fleet, in fact, um, an, a naval encounter in the Pacific, and it was discovered on the first day that the enemy side, obviously China, had put viruses in the uh, computer system of American aircraft carriers with the result that it was no longer possible to launch uh, planes from the deck by computer. It had to be done manually uh, as of the Battle of Midway back in 1942, one man on a deck waving each plane out. We're now entering an age where we will have viruses not only there, which could be undetected for months, possibly even years, but we'll have viruses with evolutionary algorithms so that they will reprogram themselves in a way in which the programmers can't even anticipate. So talk about the unknown unknowns. We're really heading into unknown territory. And I asked Martin Lubicki, who's one of the great uh, experts on cyber warfare, whether this was possible. And he said, not now, but undoubtedly, probably within the next five to 10 years. So that is the first thing. The idea of war and peace is becoming very, very blurred. And I rather like the uh, point made by another cyber expert, Lucas Keller in Oxford, when he talks about unpeace. We have actually entered uh, a stage where we are at war at the moment, constantly at war in cyberspace, whether it is the Russians who are subverting us or the Chinese who are more interested in espionage and in getting the secrets of the F-35. Because if you, if you build uh, an F-35, the most expensive procurement program in history, and the Chinese have all the details from day one, you've wasted your money, uh, basically. Is that not warfare? No, not technically. We're just going to have to live with it, I'm afraid. That's the reality. Eva? Yeah, maybe just to add that, that I think it's also good to ask this question, whether the rules of conventional warfare extends to cyberspace. Because we still don't have a definition of uh, a uh, workable definition of what constitutes an act of war in cyberspace. And, um, for example, the EU and the NATO also should define what are the circumstances that kind of allows them to launch active countermeasures when they uh, suffer cyber attack. So I think we need to come up with um, workable definitions for what is an act of war in cyberspace to um, um, 
kind of uh, come up with a collective response. Yeah, that I think was addressed in the last uh, or the panel before this that we mm -hmm. need sort of a, a, a phrases or, or a, a way of talking about this in governments that mm -hmm. can be understood and have a, a common knowledge. That one paradox that strikes me when we talk about, especially the, the concept of unpeace, is that also demands resources, development, technology to be able to win in that game in a way, or at least pursue our interests. But the, most of the debate, uh, like you touched on, uh, uh, is, is how much shall we spend on sort of conventional but uh, high-tech uh, armed forces, like uh, submarines or, or uh, new uh, with the 2% debate, with the pressure from uh, from the U.S. about burden sharing, and then I, I tend in this panel to say that where we should spend the money is is not only in conventional but in in uh, development uh, and and also technology to be able to win in this sort of more murky waters. But but if like Western governments like Norway other are sort of forced to spend everything on conventional armed forces, we will have no room to invest in that. I think that that's not uh, that's not an option. And what countries will then be left to sort of uh, uh, develop this, uh, you can call it like a second form of, of uh, military power, whatever you call it, to win in this unpeace game? Will, will that only leave a few actors that are able to do that? And in some case, what kind of countries will be able to do that? Well, I think, going back to Paul's point, I think actually our society is mobilized already. And the private sector is certainly aware that it's under threat every day and has to take the requisite measures to defend itself, otherwise it won't get in any insurance. So insurance companies require that as well. I think um, we've relied on private security companies for humanitarian uh, peacekeeping operations. We're totally reliant, actually, on private security companies, even the United States now. So that is a reality. So we used to talk about the uh, alliance between the private, voluntary, and public sectors. This was part of Blairism uh, and this vision that everyone was involved. Uh, I think that also applies in war, not just in peacekeeping. Mm -hmm. We're all involved. If you want a metaphor, uh, it would be the neighborhood watch scheme okay. in which we uh, are required to be each other's protector in, in essence. And that uh, is, I think, uh, the mo that may be the solution, Paul, to your problem, uh, getting people more mobilized on a permanent mobilization basis. That is the reality of unpeace. Any other one wants to add on that? Yes, Paul? Yeah, well, yeah I was just going to say that I, uh, it, it ought to be possible, and it is possible, because this is what's going on, um, to, to go through the acquisition process for you know, heavy metal military equipment and make it as, uh, as kinetically um, lethal as you can with giving it you know, different sorts of I don't know, ammunition and guns and whatever else. So you can do a certain amount in that. Uh, and you also need to make it as networked as you can. What else can we expect of it? You know, as, we, as I said, nobody can see into the future. You can't possibly know what sort of tank you're going to need in 2035. But you can do a certain amount today with making sure that the vehicle or the platform is, uh, is networked. Um, and has a broad, a reasonably broad range of, of capabilities. That's fine. But my real moan is about fixing too much on that and fixing too much of our innovative, uh, our imagination and our innovative capacity in making that vehicle or platform as, as smart as we can and forgetting about the other uh, aspect of innovation, which is the real prospective innovation where you are a government willing to spend a substantial amount of money at very great risk that it might be a waste of money. Uh, but it might, just occasionally, come up with something that is, um, is game-changing. And that's the problem we've got. We, we call innovation, um, or we, we think of innovation in too narrow a scope, really. It is all about designing the next tank. And I think it should be about research and technology, uh, research and development, science and technology, and so on. And I don't think governments are putting enough money into that blue, let's call it blue sky, whatever other cliched expression you want. Um, I think that's where the, the big gap is. One last question to the panel before we open up for questions. It's kind of short. Who benefits from this uh, new, uh, you know, era of unpeace? Who benefits the most in the international community from from having created an era of unpeace, like you described? Start with you, Mupe. Well, not we states. Run down. What? Well, not the states. <laughs> it's uh, multinational companies, obviously. <laughs> but what's new in that? I guess. Uh, and uh, if you want to compare authoritarian regimes with um, 
democratic ones, I would say that at the moment, perhaps the authoritarian ones. Uh, not for long, hopefully, but uh, unfortunately, I think that's the state of affairs right now. Eva? Yeah, I think I kind of agree with that. Okay. And <laughs> because of uh, this uh, asymmetric advantage that uh, authoritarian countries might have and operate in a gray zone area, challenges institutions like NATO. Um, so yeah, I agree with the what Martin mentioned. Any disagreements or additional points to it, or Christopher? Authoritarian governments. Uh, actually, I think uh, the average Chinese citizen lives in an era of unpeace at home as well. Constant surveillance by the state, the social credit uh, rating system mm. beyond the dreams of either Huxley or Orwell, in fact. Quite extraordinary. You, you can be prevented from boarding a domestic flight uh, in, the, in China now if, 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 if you're overdrawn on your social credit system, as you might be overdrawn on your credit card uh, in the West. So that's a, a, an era of unpeace where the state is actually at war with its own citizens, but won't admit to that, it's doing it for the public good. It's a much more insidious form of totalitarianism than the totalitarian societies we faced down in the Cold War. I, I don't want one comment to that. It, it does seem to me that you could make the argument that it's liberal democratic policies in general that have, uh, it feels as if we've sort of lost the initiative in this a bit. Uh, and if we have lost the initiative, then it follows that anybody else has got it. Uh, and that's the worry. I think we don't feel as if we're on the forward edge of this thing at the moment. And, and it, uh, it opens up all sorts of possibilities, which I think we find rather discomforting, to say the least. Maybe uh, we should read Frankenstein again. You know, we, we could uh, do that. Uh, just one, one quick thing. And the Chinese have now developed uh, a system which can actually identify which students are listening to the lecturer as opposed to, <laughs> to which students appear to be listening to the lecturer because of these uh, face recognition and, and various other systems are much more effective than human beings are in recognizing their own body language, just as dogs are more e efficient because we've domesticated them to be efficient in recognizing whether we fear them or not. They can recognize that. So in that system, in the classroom, is that unpeace <laughs> or not? I don't know. I'm retiring from the game, so it doesn't really <laughs> apply to me. <laughs> score so low. <laughs> as long as they don't introduce <laughs> Let me see. I, you see the iPad? You just be, uh, you know, be very scared uh, out there in the room now. I think we open up for questions. Uh, we can start there with uh, Anders. And uh, raise your hands. Uh. Thank you. Uh, Anders Romerheim, uh, Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies. Uh, a riveting panel. I've enjoyed it uh, thoroughly. Uh, I'd just like the panel to reflect on uh, a little bit more on uh, the role of strategic narratives and ideology. I, I don't think we've spoken much about ideology. Is ideology gone now? Because if, uh, the sci if you want to win a narrative battle in the cyber domain using social media platforms, you need appealing narratives. And the social control system that uh, Chris, uh, Christopher just explained is not very appealing. In the, in, in the Cold War, you'd, you had an ideology to spread. Uh, do uh, Russia and China possess a positive ideology that can be used for framing strategic narratives that can actually influence other people to drive them to their side rather than coercing them? Thank you. The appeal of China and Russia, yeah. How do you judge it? Who wants to start? Well, uh, last October, Putin addressed a gathering of bishops from the uh, Russian Orthodox Church and told them that unfortunately it might well come to war between Russia and the West and that that might even end in nuclear confrontation. But he said the good news was that because the Russians are people of faith, they would go to heaven in this wonderful paradise of, of, of liberated souls. And because of the four minute warning, we in the West who didn't believe in anything would not have time to repent and therefore we would end up in hell. Now that's a pretty convincing strategic narrative it seems to me. It certainly satisfied the audience. That's exactly what they wanted to hear because that's exactly their narrative as well when it comes to preaching on Sundays. So I think it depends very much on the audience that you are addressing, you have to, which is what your question is. You have to tailor it to your audience. And I don't think the Chinese find the social credit thing at all abominable. Uh, we would because we have a different history. 
Uh, but we've submitted ourselves to different kinds of tyrannies in the past, which we didn't find uh, all that uh, impossible. So it's storytelling, a strategic narrative, and every teller of a tale has to know the audience he's addressing. Yes, Peter. Uh, just a quick comment. I think if you, if you want to s approach the strength of strategic narratives some, from a larger point, I mean, look at the European Union and look at uh, its uh, obviously strong strategic narrative as a peace project and everything, and look at the state of the European Union at the, at the moment. I think that's uh, probably the best example of, of how you lose your strategic narrative, basically. Okay, any more questions? Yes, Karsten. Sorry to be asking questions all the time. <laughs> um, I would like to return to like my first question yesterday. And if you look behind you on the, on the roll up, there's one log. It's not a flag. It's an F for Facebook. Right? That's what we see. Uh, and and my question when you have this this nice talk about private public cooperation when dealing with these things, it's actually that the business model of Facebook and Google, lots of these big tech giants, is based on algorithms that are exploiting our data. So they're not necessarily on our side because if they're going to if you're not going to be, this technology is not going to be used against us, they have to really change the way they operate. So, uh, so I, I don't see it as, as, it's very challenging actually to, to not go further down the road towards a China model, because we're already on the way, it, as I see it. Okay, should we, we could do a few more and gather up if we want to, someone else has someone, something to add? No, okay. Facebook. Well, I, just, I, I don't want to actually talk about Facebook. I just want to address your main point, which is that we already have a surveillance society in the West. Uh, in the United States, there's something called the Future Attri Attribution System, or FAST is the acronym. And these are cameras now uh, that predict uh, human behavior. So, for example, if you're in a car park at night and you seem to be wandering from car to car, the camera will be able to determine whether you're drunk or whether you've forgotten where you parked the car, or whether you have malintent. Uh, we'll be introducing pheromonal systems uh, soon. Uh, these are systems that can actually smell fear and anxiety. And they will be very effective at airports where we will be scanned. We're already scanned like a barcode every time we go into an airport. As you know, the, the latest technology in Heathrow is going to be cameras that will be basically be scanning us through the system so we don't actually have to meet human beings. There's a heat list in Chicago. 430 people are on that list. They have been told that they are under surveillance by the uh, Chicago police force for the rest of their lives because a computer has determined that they are most likely to offend. So the idea of probable cause, which used to be at the heart of the American liberal policing system, has already gone in some uh, respects. For insurance reasons, insurance companies want to prevent crimes. They don't want to pay out on premiums uh, after the crime has been committed. It's a perfectly good capitalist thing that we want to go in for prediction. But to do that, that is based on surveillance, I'm afraid, of a very, very intrusive kind. I, I live in a city, London, where this is probably an urban myth. I'm on camera 300 times a day. The only consolation is that at least 50% of those cameras aren't working because they've broken, and some of them are actually fake. They're just intended to deter your actions. But that's it. Uh, we actually have more CCTV cameras per head of population than any other country in the world, and that includes China and Russia. And they're, <coughs> they're increasingly interlinking all of these um, uh, surveillance devices. I think it is the case, I think they've either trialed or, are, uh, um, or it's in practice on the London Underground that you can link <coughs> anomalous behavior um, tracking. So if someone comes onto a, an underground train platform and puts a bag down and then gets on the train and leaves the bag or, or whatever, that triggers a, uh, uh, an analysis device. Uh, that then triggers facial recognition of everybody who walked onto the platform. And it also triggers um, explosive detection sniffers. So the whole thing is geared up. And um, yeah, it, it's either <laughs> we go back to that good old balance, don't we, between the balance between liberty and security and finding that the sweet spot between the two. Um, and it's just too easy to err in one direction, I think. But I wanted to make a very quick point, if I could, about, about um, Facebook. I think the worm, certainly in the UK, the worm might be turning, just beginning to turn a little. 
I don't underestimate the difficulty of the task ahead of government regulation and so on, but it does seem to me that the, 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 the debate in the UK at least is, is freshening up a bit and saying, because there was <coughs> very recently some very young child who, who committed suicide on the, on, the, on, the, on the grounds of things she'd seen on, I think it was on Facebook or Instagram perhaps. Um, and so this is, this is having a bit of a political um, uh, follow-up at the moment. Um, and if I may say, um, I can't resist a bit of flippancy really, and it's all going to be solved because one of our least successful British politicians, having helped to screw up um, Brexit, uh, got his knighthood and then went off to Facebook um, for I think was some incredible salary, a guy called Sir Nick Clegg. Um, so he'll solve the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, um, to sum up, uh, the, maybe the Western and the liberal democracies have created all this wonderful technology and now we're losing at home and uh, losing our liberal values at home and also in the international society. It's, it's, it, it's kind of bleak, uh, I would say, but uh, it's lovely weather outside at least. So uh, uh, I will give the word to, to Kate and Anna Greta before we go for lunch, but uh, thank you all for, uh, for joining this panel. Thank you for your remarks and your with, uh, with very good comments. Thank you. Thank you. I will uh, give the panel uh, some mittens. You have got yours, Paul, <laughs> for you. And for the Norwegians, we will have a small token of our uh, gratitude that you came, that you can um, change in a uh, bookstore. <laughs> Thank you, Fritjof. And give this splendid panel another uh, applaud. It uh, will be lunch uh, in a minute, but first of all, um, we live in a period of rapid change, and I think that one and a half day has uh, shown us uh, that uh, this uh, period is both exciting and it's full of new, uh, not only high-tech stuff, but also uh, ethical, political, and uh, other uh, complicated uh, questions. But I would like to quote uh, Jon um, Mikael Stördal, who said today, ask not what the computers can do with us, but what we can do with computers. He is highly optimistic. And I think that without computers, we will not have all these brilliant speakers that we found in Germany, in Denmark, in England, in the United States, and all over the globe. I really thank you for coming to Oslo and that you have been spending uh, these uh, two days together with us. I would like you to give them a big applaud, all of the speakers. And then, of course, uh, it's the volunteers. You have seen them uh, with a red label crew. Uh, they are members of YATA, our youth organizations, all of them. I would like you to come in here. <laughs> all of you, come on. Led by my son, <laughs> Oscar. <laughs> um, it's been a lot of them uh, around here. These. They started out already on Sunday to pick up the speakers on Gardemoon and have been working and taking care of all the nitty gritties that uh, those of you who have organized the conference know is here uh, all behind, invisible. You can't see what they are doing, but they have done a remarkable job. And this is the future, gentlemen and ladies. Give them a big applaud. Thank you from me. And last but not least, my own crew, uh, Lea, Karn Anna, and Andreas. Could you come here? Together with me, this is the Atlantic Committee. <laughs> they have been working night and day and weekends. 
the last uh, months. Uh, and have done a remarkable job. And Khan Anna, uh, you have been the project manager. You have been, you know, controlling all of us, all of our spare time the last month, and you've done this uh, in a superb way. So please, a big applaud.